So, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, welcome to today's webinar by the Wilfried Martin Center, which is the think tank of the European People's Party and the Konstantinos Karamanlis Institute for Democracy in Athens. And we're about to enter a conversation on one of the hottest topics of these days, the perils of revisionism, i.e. security threats in the Eastern Mediterranean. So in other words, we're talking about the drilling activities by Turkish vessels in Greek and Cypriot waters and very different interpretations of international law and the law of the sea. And this has led to a major confrontation between Turkey and the European Union, but also to a major disagreement in the EU on how exactly to deal with Turkish threats and what is the right time for de-escalation and for sanctions and increased deterrence. So, but at the same time, for several years now, relations and energy cooperation between Greece, Cyprus and Israel have warmed up. And then there is the remarkable rapprochement between Israel and the United Emirates, Bahrain and possibly other Arab countries to follow. And to make things even more complicated, since August we have a much deplored linkage between the EU reaction to Turkey's action in the Eastern Mediterranean and to the crackdown against Democrats in Belarus. So there's plenty to talk about. And I couldn't imagine two better speakers in this conversation than Minister Nikos Vendias, the Foreign Minister of Greece, or the Hellenic Republic, who is speaking from Athens. And from New York City, David Harris, the CEO of the American Jewish Committee. Good morning. And uh, we will spend around 30 minutes among the three of us discussing, and then we'll open up for half an hour of Q&A so that we finish all together around 5 p.m. Central European time. So without further ado, I would now like to, first of all, ask uh, Minister Nikos Vendias, um, can you explain to us what's at stake and which revisionism we are talking about here? Well, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity, and it's a great pleasure to see David again. We haven't seen each other for, for, for quite a while, but I, as I was saying before, before muting, uh, is I always remember our fights together against the Golden Dawn on those difficult days of 2012 and 2013. Very great to see you again. Uh, well, I have to say, answering your question, that we recently went through a very intense period. Uh, we have seen a huge escalation in Turkey's provocative and illegal behavior in the Aegean, in the Eastern Mediterranean, in the Everest region. So we have to take a step back and look over these extremely challenging moments in our region. What we see here is revisionism, a strategy of reinterpretation of historical facts and systematic questioning of established rules and truths. We see powerful and inflammatory rhetoric coupled with the mechanism of projecting power or threatening the use of force. This reminds us of a not so remote troubled past in our continent. Revisionism led to clashes and ultimately to devastating conflicts in Europe and in the Balkans. Let me attempt to briefly paint a picture of what has been happening. Ankara's aggressive policies aim at questioning and undermining the established order and the conventional legal framework as laid in the Treaty of Lausanne, a treaty which is the cornerstone agreement between Turkey and its neighbors since 1923, almost a century ago. Turkey's illegal actions in Cyprus, in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, and now in the Eastern Mediterranean demonstrate Turkey's will to redraw, redefine, and rectify injustice, according to them, done in Lausanne. And also there is a new idea, the blue homeland, Mavi Vatan dropped it. We say in Greece, the blue homeland and the green horses. Turkey has been consistent in one thing only, and that is the truth, illegal and provocative content. With violations of Greece's sovereignty of the national earth space and the territorial waters on a daily basis, with the continued violations of Cyprus sovereignty and sovereign rights, with repeated attempts to usurp Greece's sovereign rights by signing illegal agreements, such as the so-called Memorandum of Understanding with 
the administration of Tripoli, by orchestrating this past February and March massive attempts of illegal crossing of the Greek, that is the European Union borders, by openly and repeatedly threatening Greece with war in violation of the United Nations Charter if Greece exercises its legal right to expand its territorial waters beyond six nautical miles, by using a perfectly legal agreement of delimitation of exclusive economic zone between two sovereign states, Greece and Egypt, as a pretext to avoid dialogue and move on with its latest plans to create theta complete. An example of this is the old race research vessel, which repeatedly violated our sovereign rights and jeopardized the stability in the region. And please allow me to say that there's also another angle. By choosing to escalate tension, Ankara has in fact chosen to ignore NATO's best interests in the region. We all know that NATO is an alliance that Turkey is a member of. This risks causing irreparable damage to the southeastern flank of NATO. Not to mention Ankara's cooperation with extremists in Syria, in Libya, and its controversial political affiliations with Iran, Venezuela, Belarus, Hamas, and so on and so forth. Um, to conclude, this is afraid that Turkey, if left unchallenged, would even further expand destabilizing activities in other regional areas, such as the Western Balkans. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, I would like to have to, to, to ask you just one follow-up question before we turn to David Harris. And that is, having said all this, what should be the EU reaction? Are you, are you happy with, with what has happened until now? Or how could the EU improve its reaction to these Turkish provocations and illegal action? Well, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. This is an ongoing discussion in Greece, uh, in Europe, in, in the Council of Ministers, in the Council of Heads of State. And we have a very clear answer to that. The European Union should stand by the side of its members, not just because that it's the membership that defines the standing, but because this is a situation in which the rule of law, and especially the rule of international law, is at stake. And what the European Union has to do clearly and definitely is that if Turkey does not behave, sanctions should be imposed. And when I'm speaking about sanctions, I'm speaking about crippling sanctions to the Turkish economy. What we have done as European Union is that we have imposed sanctions when a state def defies international law. That was the case in Russia, rightly so. That is the case and should be the case in Belarus, and sad, that should be the case if Turkey thinks that it could act above and beyond international law, international law of the sea. That is the European move. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for, for, this, for this very clear explanation. I think we're, we're going to come back later on to the point, what is the right time? Uh, to, to sanctions, or in other words, how, how many days does Turkey have to be to, to start behaving? I think there may be a slight disagreement among the member states, but let me first turn to David Harris and ask you, uh, uh, David Harris, what is the role of the United States in all this? Have, have we heard anything from the US government, which used to be rather active in reconciling uh, uh, NATO allies or mediating in cases of conflict between uh, member states of NATO. Roland, first of all, thank you for this um, opportunity to appear with um, my good friend Nikos Nadendias. Um, and you brought us back together again after several years, as the minister said. Uh, I also, I think, need to explain to this audience um, why I'm participating. It's obvious why Nikos Dendias is as the foreign minister of Greece. But the American Jewish Committee in the 1980s uh, looked carefully at the Eastern Mediterranean. And for us, there was an anomaly. And the anomaly was that the three democratic countries of the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, Israel, Cyprus, and Greece, uh, had shall we say, chilly relations. We believed at the time, together with our Hellenic American friends, that there was much greater potential for these three countries to develop closer ties 
and ultimately to become a strategic triangle, not directed against any other country, but because it was in the intrinsic interests of these three countries. So my involvement uh, has been uh, over the span of some 35 years in the Eastern Mediterranean, and I'm, I'm thrilled that we've lived to see the dream of the strategic triangle emerge. I will say at the same time, Roland, again, just as backdrop, that um, we also have been friends of Turkey over many years. Uh, we had always recalled, for example, the fact that the Ottoman Empire had given refuge uh, to Jews fleeing Spain uh, at the end of the 15th century. Uh, and uh, we always expressed our gratitude. Uh, in fact, in 1999, after the earthquake in Turkey, uh, we um, helped build a school in Adapazari, uh, which was the epicenter of the, of, of, the, of the earthquake. But we went on our first visit to see President or then Prime Minister Erdogan in 2003, shortly after he took office. And we had a 90-minute meeting with him. And I will tell you, having had thousands of diplomatic meetings in my career, I'm old enough to say that, uh, it was one of the chilliest, most um, concerning meetings that I've ever participated in. And it was clear to us that under Prime Minister Erdogan, Turkey was going to go in a very different direction, uh, in a more neo-Ottoman direction, in a more aggressive imperialist direction, and yes, in a more Islamist direction. Uh, and we've seen the consequences of this over the last 17 years. To your question, I will tell you that we came back from Ankara in 2003, and we spoke with the Bush administration, and we shared our concerns. To a large degree, I, I believe that the Bush administration chose to ignore those concerns. We shared our concerns then with the Obama administration. To a large degree, again, speaking frankly, I believe they, they largely um, ignored those concerns. And we shared those concerns more recently with the current Trump administration. The problem has been, Roland, uh, from our perspective, that for each of these three administrations, and I won't go back any further, Turkey represents a pivotal country, and therefore a country that's very difficult to approach in a binary fashion, either fully embrace or fully reject. Uh, and applying the nuance, the, the sort of diplomatic nuance to the issue, has proven quite challenging. And we've seen in, in each of the three cases, uh, the Bush administration, the Obama administration, and certainly the earlier years of the Trump administration, uh, a kind of desire to re-engage Turkey and believe, as we saw in the Obama years, that Turkey could actually be a model for the so-called Arab Spring, the kind of convergence of Islam and modernity, uh, and provide the answer to, to, to these collapsing countries that were trying to sort of reimagine themselves in North Africa and in the Middle East. And then when you add to that the notion of Turkey as this sort of large country at the cross-section of continents, a home to American and NATO air bases, the eastern flank of NATO, uh, and Erdogan's kind of aggressive, intimidating, bullying personality, but from our perspective, U.S. policy needed to sort of catch up. Most recently, uh, from our perspective, we've seen changes in U.S. policy for the better. One of the important changes, which Minister Dendias can speak to as well, of course, is the um, Eastern Mediterranean Partnership and Energy Act. Uh, Cyprus has now been taken off of the U.S. arms embargo list. Uh, we've seen more frequent visits by Secretary Pompeo to the region in fact, Nikos, I believe you met with him in Vienna uh, not long ago. Uh, he recently visited Cyprus. Uh, he's coming back to the region. He participated in the, uh, in the talks that you had in Jerusalem uh, among Israel, Cyprus, and Greece. So there's a more sort of, there's a, a, a more engagement, more awareness that Turkey cannot be treated as it was in the past by the United States. It needs to be far more nuanced, nuanced and nuance cannot become an excuse for a lack of candor. And so we're beginning to see the candor as well in American, in, in American foreign policy in the region. We consider this a welcome step. Thank you so much, David. I would like to, to stick to the, to the region, uh, regional angle here and ask you about Israeli-Turkish relations, Israeli-Greek relations, and how that plays out in this 
conflict about uh, about actually the rule of law uh, and about energy resources in the Eastern Mediterranean. Well, it's interesting that as we meet today, the foreign ministers of Turkey, Iran, and Qatar, I believe, are meeting in Istanbul. And I think that <laughs> that begins to frame the answer, Roland, to your question. Um, Turkey was one of the most um, vociferous countries opposing the, um, um, the historic peace deals uh, that were signed on the White House lawn on September the 15th, uh, exactly one week ago today. Uh, Turkey has um, played host to Hamas. Uh, Turkey has become a, a fierce opponent of Israel against a backdrop of warm relations between Turkey and Israel over decades. Warm relations in more or less every sphere. Uh, but under Erdogan, Turkey has chosen a different path. And it, it was said before by Mr. Dendias in his opening comment. Uh, it has turned uh, away from its traditional partners and allies. It has turned east. Uh, it has turned to uh, Iran, to Hamas, uh, to Syria, to the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, to Russia, uh, to Venezuela. Uh, and um, that's its chosen strategic path. I happen to believe, as a, an old friend of Turkey, that it's a mistaken path. It's a path uh, of regression, not progression. Uh, I believe, and I'm sure Nikos shares this view, that the Eastern Mediterranean is showing promise of, 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 new, uh, of new possibilities. Uh, and, um, and Turkey is not only interfering with those new possibilities, uh, but it is also trying to sabotage them. And I think that that runs counter to not only Greek and Cypriot and Israeli interests, it, it runs counter to European and NATO interests, and ultimately, if I dare say, I believe it runs counter to the Ataturkian vision of the direction in which Turkey should be going. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like at this point to ask the same question to both of you. And, and you know, uh, yes, we have just been talking about Erdogan. And I want to go a little bit deeper into the question of his motivations here. Uh, David, you mentioned the neo-Ottoman uh, thinking. Um, uh, you know, leaving old allies behind, turning into a new direction. But why is this happening? Could it have something to do with domestic trouble that uh, he's feeling and seeking, uh, you know, external enemies in order to mobilize uh, the Turkish population behind him or something like that? David. I was going to defer to Nikos, but. Um... Uh, listen, uh, uh, Roland, in, in, in our assessment, it, it's a combination of factors. I, I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all answer. Uh, you know, there are always uh, domestic concerns, but I don't think that that's the driving force here. I think the driving force, and we saw it in our first meeting with uh, Prime Minister Erdogan in 2003, 17 years ago, the driving force is this kind of messianic vision of, um, of Erdogan as leader. Uh, Erdogan as leader in the region, uh, Erdogan as leader of, um, of, of, an, of, of an Islamist movement regionally and even more globally. Uh, uh, and therefore Erdogan as um, a bully uh, seeking to intimidate others, by the way, at times with success, uh, Turkey is a big, powerful country. But uh, I, I think people have made a living in the last number of years by misreading um, Erdogan, by sort of wanting to believe that they were who they wanted him to be. Again, I go back to my earlier reference. Um, the United States wanted Erdogan to be the, the role model for the marriage of modernity and Islam. Uh, they, they wanted um, Turkey to play that, that, that critically important role at the intersection of the Middle East, uh, Asia, uh, and the former Soviet Union. So they allowed sort of wishful thinking to replace hard-nosed analytical thinking about who he was. But in reality, I believe he was signaling who he was all along. The problem was that, that, that a number of people simply chose not to believe 
uh, his signals. Uh, they chose to, 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 to interpret them otherwise. Now, as we say, the chickens have come home to roost. He is who he says he is. In that sense, he's done us a favor. He's told us who he is. Now we have to grapple with the consequences of the fact that he, he's been entrenched in power for nearly 18 years. Uh, he shows no signs, at least not yet, that I know of, 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 um, of diminishing power. Uh, he is flexing his muscles. Uh, he is increasingly um, aggressive, including, uh, as Nikos mentioned, the deal with one half of Libya that kind of eliminates Crete and other parts of Greece from the map. Um, so the, the real challenge is no longer to analyze Erdogan. I believe the real challenge, Roland, is to analyze our response to Erdogan, our collective response to Erdogan. That's the challenge. The easier part is the description. The more difficult but more pressing part is the prescription for the challenge. Indeed. Uh, let me turn to Nikos Dendias now and ask you more or less the same question. I mean, why is he doing this in your view? But maybe more importantly, a follow up here. Aren't we seeing some kind of de-escalation by Turkey, you know, withdrawing this uh, research vessel and its naval uh, entourage, its naval escorts uh, to, um, to the home port? Uh, doesn't this give Greece, Cyprus, the European Union, an opportunity, a window of opportunity that may soon be closing? Well, uh, first of all, sir, <laughs> thank you for the question. I have to comment, David, for his clarity of vision, which I have to say even us being neighbors, we sometimes failed to see. Because, as he rightly said, uh, sometimes you see what you wish to see. And Turkey being at the crossroads between Asia and Europe, and Turkey being really uh, seated where a Christian and, and the Byzantine Empire was there for more than 1,000 years, and following the tradition of that empire, we thought that turn, Turkey eventually aspired to become a member of the European Union, would like to accept the European key, the European ideals, the European values, not because they were European, but because they're pan-humanistic, that eventually Turkey would become a modern, functioning democratic state, which then, by principle, it will resolve the, the, any sort of problems it had with its neighbors. because. If you're a democratic state, I mean, and a modern democratic state, and you accept the, the European values, then you can resolve all the issues you have with the neighboring states. But unfortunately, life has proven us wrong, and we are sorry to say that. And we only hope, we only hope that Turkey at some time in the future would really reverse course and come back towards what Atatürk had described for Turkey as its future a century ago. But the truth is, if we see clearly right now in front of us, we should do that. We should see clearly out of the window what we have hoped for is it's not there. And what it is there, it's exactly the opposite of what we have hoped for. The emergence of a radical Muslim power in the region, which would like to host radicalism, which would like to host Muslim brotherhood, which has an understanding for terrorism, which have a clear relation with Iran, with all the powers in the world that are against what we stand for. Now, what we can do about it? Well, it is clear. We have to create an understanding between the states that see clearly that this is a geopolitical challenge of the highest magnitude. And that is something that may be difficult to explain even to our European friends or partners. Because sometimes they believe what, what, that the question in the Eastern Mediterranean, for example, it's a question of hydrocarbons. It is not the case at all. It is not the case. And it is not the case for one very simple reason, that the Mitsotakis government in Greece has clearly stated that it is a Greek government, a green government, not a Greek government. It is, of course, also a Greek government, but it's a green government and is going, not going to license exploitation of hydrocarbons. We believe to the green economy. That's where our future lies. So that cannot be our difference with Turkey. And also a, a simple delimitation. Again, it cannot be our difference with Turkey because we have delimited with Italy, we have delimited with Egypt, and it's quite easy to delimit with Turkey, provided we accept the rules of international law, if the national law of the seas. So it is not that. What it is, unfortunately, I'm afraid, is a grand idea backwards. And by that I mean Turkey revisioning 
what they believe is an Ottoman past and a past of an empire, and even more than that. For example, uh, President Erdogan celebrated the Battle of Magikert in 1071, the first battle in which the Byzantine Empire lost, but not against the Ottoman Turks, against the Soljuk Turks, another tribe. But for that, those details do not matter for President Erdogan. As long as it is a battle of a Muslim against a Christian, it's something to celebrate, which is not the modern approach. We are not anti-Muslim in any way. In the Greek, in, in the Greek thrust, we have the most mosques per capita in the world, 153 mosques in a very small region of Greece. But the the, the question is a question of, about values. Is President, President Erdogan wishing to subscribe to the modern democratic pan-humane values or not? That is the question. And if not, which is an answer I don't like, but an answer that stands out of my window, then we have to create an understanding between states that would like to stop that or would like to address that. And Israel and Cyprus and Greece are pivotal in this effort. But that still leaves this question of the window of opportunity. I mean, uh, the, the withdrawal of the auto trades has been uh, welcomed by some in the European Union as a sign of uh, uh, maybe Erdogan is willing to talk and maybe this should not be the right time to enact sanctions against Turkey, but to actually, uh, you know, step up the, com the communication and the dialogue. Uh, so I, I really want to feel this question to you, Minister, what do you think about this window of opportunity? Well, thank you. Well, I, I wouldn't characterize the window because it's a window is too wide and too full of light. But there is a side. There is a, maybe a small light in, in the end of the corridor that maybe, maybe shows that there is a chance. And I have to say, being a peace-loving nation, we will take upon that chance. And we hope that Turkey we do likewise. You see, uh, again, we have a pile of thousands of provocations on the one side of the table, and on the other side, we have just this, you not know, taking back, it has been clarified to us, just for a few days, just for some repair work of all its race. We will take upon this effort, and we will try to restart our exploratory talks. By the way, as we are talking, probably the announcement will be made that we will be restart, restarting those exploratory talks with Turkey. It's talks, right? it's not negotiations. Talks means we try to find rules according to which we will conduct negotiations. And by the way, why is it so difficult? Because Turkey does not accept international law as the standard rule. With any other state, we never had exploratory talks on how we start negotiations because it goes axiomatically that the negotiations will take part, will take place according to international law. With, with Turkey, we have to find what is the terms of reference? But yet again, in answering clearly your question, yes. Maybe, 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 and I hope that we are right, this could present us with an opportunity. But that remains to be seen. It's too early to call. Thank you. Could I, could I join the conversation? David, go ahead. You know, I, I, I'm reminded um, of, of the old Soviet Union where um, the KGB would um, arrest an innocent person and then in negotiations with the U.S. government would release the innocent person and then expect both the positive media coverage and some kind of reward from Washington. But of course, why the positive media coverage and why the reward from Washington for having done something that was illegal and inappropriate in the first place? So. Again, uh, Minister Dendias is in a much better position than I am to judge Turkey's sincerity. But from, from where I sit, uh, clearly, uh, if Turkey withdraws the ship, it, it's a welcome development, but it needs to be seen in a larger context. Uh, is this uh, simply temporary? Is this tactical? Or does this uh, suggest some fundamental rethinking of Turkish strategy? I think it would be incredibly premature to suggest that it reflects a radical rethinking of Turkish strategy. Again, as I mentioned, as we meet today, the foreign ministers of Turkey and Iran are meeting. So if in fact Turkey is trying to, as we say, to kind of snooker uh, 
uh, a largely sleeping West by withdrawing the ship and then pointing the finger at this withdrawal and letting the West believe that this is the beginning of a, of, 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 of a new Turkish thinking in the region, I would urge caution here. Uh, it's going to take a lot more. I mean, just think, Roland, and again, we don't, you know, if we start piling on, you know, every transgression will never get anywhere. But this is the same president who came to Washington a couple of years ago. And when he and his entourage encountered demonstrators in Washington, D.C., peaceful demonstrators unleashed his bodyguards in Washington, D.C., to attack and injure people protesting peacefully. By the way, not in Ankara, not in Izmir, in Washington, D.C. This is the same Turkish leader who has been trying to manipulate Turks in Europe to play a, a very complex political game, where on the one hand, they're, 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 he's encouraging them to integrate, but not fully integrate, but to continue to be a kind of, from his perspective, from his perspective, a Trojan horse for Turkish interests from the Netherlands to Austria, to Germany, to France. Uh, he's dividing up the Mediterranean. He's providing a home to Hamas, which is on the EU terrorism list. I can keep going. So yes, if he pulls back this ship and doesn't return it, as Minister Dendia suggested he might, we pause, we assess, but we don't rush. We don't rush. Uh, to rush is, is to reveal a kind of over-eagerness and bullies, strong men, smell weakness very, very quickly and exploit it very skillfully. I, I think we've seen that with people like Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping also. All right, but let me, let me now come to a question from our audience. Um, and that question is, why doesn't Greece follow Cyprus in blocking the sanctions against Belarus in order to get a unified position uh, uh, against the Turkish violations of territorial integrity. So, you know, as you know, Cyprus just yesterday vetoed, vetoed uh, uh, new sanctions against Belarus. Um, and, and Greece, in, at this time, actually voted together with the uh, rest of the member states. So here's the question from the audience, why doesn't uh, uh, Greece act in unison with Cyprus? Well, uh, this is a difficult one. Uh, it needs a little explaining, but, but thank you for the opportunity. Well, what Greece did, first of all, for, for in, there are two different things. There's sanctions for the case of Cyprus and an option for sanctions if Turkey continues provocations against Greece. So we have two different set of sanctions or discussion for sanctions. No. Cyprus uh, has clearly achieved in Gimni, which is the unofficial meeting of ministers, of uh, foreign ministers of the European Union, for an agreement that the Belarus sanctions and the, the sanctions against person because of the violations of the sovereignty and the sovereign waters of Cyprus will go hand in hand. And what happened really uh, yesterday in Brussels was Cyprus reminding, reminding the other ministers of that agreement. That is why the decision for sanctions on the case of Belarus, which again Cyprus agreed that should be imposed, went up to the council to be decided, to the leaders. On the other hand, Greece has not asked for sanctions in this case. Greece, in the case of Greece, Greece has only asked for an option paper describing the sanctions that the European Union would take in case Turkey insisted on violation of the Greek continental self. And Greece has made it clear from the beginning that sanctions against Belarus is something independent. The injury, if I call it such way, to democracy in the case of Belarus was already established. We can see it on our screens every morning, every day, that Lukashenko is asking in a despicable way against his own people, and that Greece accepted that sanctions should be imposed, and that's that. So there's two different cases. 
I have to understand to, to, to say that for the public, when they hear the word sanctions, say everything they think it falls under, but it's not exactly the case. It's two different sets. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Just one brief follow up to this here. Um, the, the I think I think the the, the, the uh, a moment when push comes to shove will actually be uh, the next European Council on the 24th and 25th uh, uh, of uh, of September, the end of this week, in other words, Thursday, Friday. So, uh, uh, Nikos Dendias, could I have scenarios? What will happen uh, provided that Turkey does not resend the research vessel and the naval escort? To, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the uh, Greek uh, waters. Um, it, what, what do you think uh, 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 could be a scenario if there is no direct escalation from Turkey? Are we still going to have Greece, Cyprus and other member states uh, uh, arguing for uh, sanctions against Turkey? Well, again, two different sets of sanctions. By the way, it was nice what you said. You, you reminded us and I uh, the fact that Oruç race with the, the research vessel, by the way, ah, may, may I tell you something funny? Turkey has five research vessels. Each one of them has a name either of a conqueror or of a pirate admiral. None of those research vessels has the name of a scientist, of a novelist, or of, of, of a poet. No, Oruç race is a pirate, as is Hadredin Barbaros as it Fatih, which is a conqueror sultan. So that's that's the, the perception of Turkey on the scientific work, you know, pirate. Uh, now, on, on the issues of, of, and also the Oruç race was followed by a huge armada. I was flying to Israel to see my friend and counterpart, Gabi Eskenazi, and we flew over that armada, and it was funny. It reminded me he, he, that when I was a kid, I saw the film, The Battle of Midway, and I remember the American pilot flying through the, the, the clouds and suddenly seeing the Japanese fleet. And it was exactly the same because in, in both cases, the, the sea was full of, 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 of vessels, of gray vessels, you know, around this, in our case, around this red dot, the, the Oro Trace research vessel. But now, if, if Oro Trace stays in port and the Turkish Amada stays in port, the, the European Council, in my humble opinion, has to do two different things. In case of Greece, he should keep on the instruction to prepare an option paper of sanctions. Of course, not impose sanctions, because nothing would be there to sanction against. Just to be ready if Turkey does not behave. Because as they very rightly said before, uh, let us see, let us see, it's too early to call. We cannot just stay in one small sample of act, of Turkey acting according to international law, of, re of really repairing an injury, that's what they did and say, oh, we are finished, fine. Turkey is a great country, it's a law-abiding country, etc. That's not the case. So let's be ready for the future. Let's have sanctions ready in order not to have to use them. That is the case of Greece. In the case of Cyprus, the injury is still there. It's happening as we speak. The Turkish vessels, they're drilling and doing illegal research, not just in uh, the exclusive economic zone of Cyprus, by the way, a legally delimited zone with Israel, with Egypt, with Lebanon, but also in, in Cyprus's territorial waters. So injury is there, so sanctions should be imposed according to the existing voted and agreed framework of the European Union. I think that makes it a little clearer. Thank you. Yes, uh, thanks very much. That, I think that clarifies the situation. Um, I have another question, and this is this is probably to David Harris. Um, uh, wasn't specified by by the member of the audience, but it refers to the U.S. government, and it says rumors have it that uh, the U.S. government is deliberately giving Turkey a free ride uh, for regional concerns. Um, I mean, this is basically returning to, to, to my initial question about the, the current U.S. government's uh, position in this. Could you elaborate a little more on this? Um, I, I, can only, I can only offer my perspective, which uh, is not as a representative of the U.S. government, um, but from my perch at the American Jewish Committee. Um, 
uh, we've seen um, some rethinking of American policy towards Turkey. Uh, I made earlier reference to it. Uh, I hope Minister Dendias um, will confirm that rethinking, uh, because otherwise we need to know <laughs> if we're deluding ourselves. But um, it's clear in the congressional passage and President Trump's signing of the Eastern Med Partnership Act, this was a major step forward for U.S. policy in Eastern Med and um, a, a major step closer uh, in our partnership both with Greece and with Cyprus. And there are a number of illustrations, Roland, we don't have the time to go through them. But for example, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey Pyatt, the U.S. Ambassador in Athens, has been enormously busy in deepening that relationship with Greece on every front, strategic, uh, economic, diplomatic, go down the list. And I think the same is, um, is largely true for Cyprus. Of course, one distinction is that Cyprus is not a NATO member. And also, we've heard some tougher language from the United States with respect to Turkish behavior, both in private and in public. Now, how will this translate into policy? Rhetoric is, is a tool of policy, but it, it's not policy itself. By the way, if I, if I can transition for just one second, Roland, you know, the EU is confronting this issue again and again. The EU um, bemoans what many in the EU believe is a lack of American leadership. The EU talks about um, increased and more assertive EU leadership. Yet when it's confronted with not the soft issues, but the hard issues, Ukraine, Belarus, Turkey, Iran, I would add Hezbollah, you see within the European Union division a certain hesitation uh, uh, between those who want to kind of act more assertively and aggressively as leaders and those who would rather sit on the fence or hold back, or even while criticizing the United States, somehow hope that the United States as a deus ex machina will come and somehow fix the problems. So I think if one wants to draw larger lessons, not just about the US role, but about Europe, leadership is about decision making. Leadership is not simply about posturing and asserting and reasserting values, although they are incredibly important the self-definition. It's about um, decision-making. And Turkey poses, I think, um, a case study in the need for European leadership. So yes, let's talk about the United States, but not without talking about Europe. And here I will just add one word. And I think within Europe, again, I would, I, I would be interested in, 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 in Nikos' view. France, I think in this particular case, has shown more leadership and most we have our issues with France, uh, for example, on the Hezbollah issue, uh, where it's created this artificial bifurcation between the so-called military and political wing of what is so obviously a unitary terrorist organization, for goodness sakes. But on the issue of the Eastern Med, France has, has matched its policy and its action to its rhetoric and to its words. And I think it offers an example which others should follow. France has ships that others don't have, but, but you're absolutely right. Uh, it's, it certainly is a question of political will and of, of the general uh, readiness to step up for, for, for principles and values. But here, here is my question to, to, to Nicolaus Dendias. Many people, including Commission President Ursula von der Leyen recently, have admitted to the decision-making problems of the EU and have said that, well, then we need to change the principle of unanimity in, at least for a limited number of questions, for example, including sanctions. She mentioned that in her State of the Union speech last week. What, what do you think about this qualified majority, qualified majority voting uh, on foreign policy questions in the European Union? Would it actually speed up decision making? Would it make us readier to, um, well, put our put our uh, 
our money where our mouth is and actually stand up for principles. Well, thank you for this opportunity. It's, uh, uh, it is something that needs to be discussed. I, I'm afraid that I tend to agree with David more than with uh, the president of uh, the commission, that the question is not unanimity or majority vote here. It's a question of clear leadership. And, and that is what it is, that the European Union, which I am an admirer of, it's a unique experiment in, in the history of mankind, and, but it's in the first stages, 50, 60 years in human history, at uh, a small time in order for something to develop, something so ambitious, something so grand as the, as the European Union. But it's clear that European Union lacks leadership here. What we need is leadership. It is not a question of a few countries blocking a majority that has already been established and is willing to act. Here, for example, I, I sense some sort of lack of clarity of purpose in Germany. Uh, what, what would we suggest? Have a majority outvoting the German presidents in the council? That, that will not work under any rules. The question is, would Germany, for example, which is the European superpower economically, wishing to take leadership within Europe on issues of foreign policy? Because as David very rightly said, France, in this case, in this Mediterranean, has a clear vision. And France was willing to dispatch its frigates and its ships according to its vision. Where Germany, on the other hand, has a clear vision of human rights, clear visions of the rule of law, clear vision of international law, but there was no German frigate presence. Uh, there in, in, in any way. So, for the European Union, what is required, in, in my humble opinion, is leadership, not majority or a minor majority or rules of decision making. Thank you. Okay, I, I think I think people in Berlin have gotten this message now. Uh, it's been expressed quite clearly. Uh, but uh, yes, I absolutely agree, if I may, uh, uh, as a moderator, uh, abuse of my prerogatives here. And, and yes, indeed, uh, uh, the German leadership in matters of defense, security, and you know, standing up firmly for principles and values is sorely lacking. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, well, I, if I may be allowed to interrupt, I was, I was complaining to a German friend of mine about this lack of leadership of Germany. Uh, especially a, a times where Germany holds the presidency of the European Union. So the two in one, the biggest economic power and the presidency. And he told me something that I kept in mind, which may give us an explanation. He told me, look, do you remember from your German? I had German in, in high school, five years of German, although I have forgotten, unfortunately, most of it now. But he told me, do you remember from your high school days, what's the, the word for leader in German? And the truth is the word for leader is fear. So Germany has to go through a stage of reassessing its role in the world. That is, that is true. It may, may, it may take another generation. But unfortunately, in our case, President Erdogan does not wait for a generation for Germany to mature. So we need German leadership now here in the Eastern Mediterranean. And again, uh, if you allow me that, also another small remark. This shows clearly now how much the United States president is, is not missing because Jeff, for example, has done, Jeff Pyatt has done a lot of work. And, and uh, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo has been ongoing back and forth in the region continuously. But how much American presence is required? Thank you. Thanks very much. David, do you want to come in here? David, you need to, un you need to unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, if, if I remember my, my, my German language correctly, we're really at this moment, I think both Nikos Dendias and I sort of reflecting on Treppenwitz der Weltgeschichte, uh, which means a, 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 an irony of history here. Why? Well, because Greece as a nation suffered as much, if not more, than just about any nation under. Uh, Nazi German occupation, and because as a Jew, 
whose mother and father were both Holocaust survivors, which is my case, we are both saying the same thing, that in the year 2020, very mindful of history, I don't think that either of us have forgotten history for a moment. We have enough trust and confidence in the Germany of today to be able to say publicly, publicly, that we are looking for German leadership. That's not something I ever thought I would say when I was younger. My parents would be spinning in their graves right now. But, but I think Germany has earned, especially in recent years, the trust and confidence of those of us who engage regularly with Berlin and with its leaders, beginning with a very distinguished chancellor. And we are saying that we, we count on inspired, engaged German leadership as essential to European leadership. And absent German leadership, Europe will be talking a very good game, but its ability to impact events from, from Ukraine and Belarus to Turkey will be far more limited. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, too many Germans, and this really refers to the majority of public opinion, still want to be a big Switzerland. Uh, this is this is still an attractive aspiration. We have changed. We have come a long way from 1989, 1990, uh, but not fast enough for uh, developments around us. And okay, uh, I want to finish here my role as as the German uh, and <laughs> go back to my role as moderator. Um, I, we have another question from the audience uh, that it, uh, asks about a possible geopolitical, well, competition or cooperation between France and the United States in the Eastern Mediterranean. Gentlemen, what is your, what is your guess? Uh, is there, are, are US and France's interests more or less on the same line, maybe not equally intense, or are they different? David, you go first. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure that I, I'm really able to offer um, a, an insightful answer, Roland. I would like to believe, I understand that, that hope cannot drive policy, but I would like to believe that at the end of the day, we're on the same page. I mean, very few, it, it happens rarely that two countries have identical interests. It happens much more often that democratic countries have overlapping interests. I believe that we in France have overlapping interests. I think that issues like um, Turkey, today's Turkey, just like today's Russia, uh, or the challenge of today's Belarus, are best addressed when there is the maximum level of cooperation and understanding between the two great centers of democratic rule in this case, North America and Europe. When we work together, we don't guarantee solutions. When we work apart, we almost guarantee problems. So as a, as a committed transatlanticist, I'm, I'm choosing to believe that whatever the specific differences might be, Roland, that at the end of the day, we have a shared interest in this case, number one, in a Turkey that um, that reconsiders uh, its current posture and re-engages with, uh, with, with, with us, that is with Europe, with the United States, with this community of values, uh, number one. Number two, that it contributes to a stable, secure, prospering Eastern Med as being in the interests of all. I'll go a step further. For a number of years, we at the American Jewish Committee have been saying We've, we visualize the day when the European Union project will find fertile ground in the Middle East, beginning in the Eastern Mediterranean, Roland. I believe that the founding of the European Union was perhaps the most ambitious and successful peace project in modern history. And I think Europe has a great deal to offer the Eastern Med. And we're beginning to see it now with Greece, Cyprus, Israel, Egypt, 
uh, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Jordan, perhaps one day if, if the Palestinians come to the peace table instead of, instead of the instead of the streets of confrontation, we can reimagine the Middle East. It sounds absurd today to some, but I have no doubt that when Robert Schumann uh, and Jean Monnet and others tasked after the Second World War with ending the prospect of war on European soil, their challenge was no less daunting. So the real question is, for me, can France and the United States, can Europe and the United States align on that vision of a new Eastern Med slash Middle East? In which case, we, we need to align on Turkish policy as well, because today, Turkey is doing everything it can to sabotage the vision of the new Middle East, which Nikos Dendias and his counterparts in Israel and Cyprus and Egypt and Jordan are trying to build. And that's something we can't ignore or minimize or trivialize, we need to engage and confront. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think we have to slowly start wrapping up. Uh, I have one more question from the audience. I mean, I would love to continue this conversation. Okay. So many points we haven't touched upon yet. But here is, here is one question that probably uh, everybody in the audience will be interested in. Uh, how about the future uh, US administration? Would it make a difference in the Eastern Mediterranean question that we've been discussing? Who is president in Washington? Maybe David Harris first. Ah, I, I would love to hear what Nichols has to say on that one. Don't let him off the hook. <laughs> he, he's, he'll but he gave it much more experience on that. Also, <laughs> I, I will offer an opinion. I, I would be clear. I'm not, I'm not hiding be, behind my identity as a minister, but uh, please. Let us have your view. It would be greatly important. I, I, as I said earlier, Roland, um, uh, having been involved with several U.S. administrations of both political parties, uh, Turkish policy throughout the last 20 years, if not longer, uh, has not dramatically shifted from one administration to the other. Although I will, I will say, and I, I need to stress, the American Jewish Committee is strictly nonpartisan. Uh, we, we do not, will not endorse candidates for office, so no one should interpret what I'm saying. But I think Nikos Tendias will agree, Joe Biden is, has been well known in Greece and Cyprus for decades. I think both countries consider him a close friend. But if he becomes president, those voices in the U.S. administration who say, yes, Mr. President, all true about Athens and Nicosia, but don't forget, we have bases in Turkey. Uh, it's the eastern flank of NATO. We have profound uh, strategic interests because of the borders with Syria, Iraq, Iran, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The question will be, how will the next president, whether it's Donald Trump or Joe Biden, deal with those other geostrategic realities which it's easier to address when you're in opposition or when you're an NGO like I am. But when you have the responsibility of decision-making, much tougher, because when you have the responsibility of decision-making, actions have consequences, just as inactions also have consequences. So all I can say is, let's see. But I think there's, there's a consensus emerging in both parties, especially, we haven't mentioned it, after the S-400 deal, especially after the S-400 deal, there's a consensus in both parties that we cannot go along with our previous line on Turkey. It no longer serves American slash NATO slash Western interests. That's an emerging consensus. And from our perspective, as bipartisan advocates, that's a very significant development. Thank you. Thank you so much. One last 30 seconds, please, from Nikos Zendias uh, about this question. Biden or Trump, and what's the effect on the crisis we're discussing? Well, it's not for us to choose be between the candidates. It's for the American society and the American people. 
I have to say that uh, I, I even personally know Joe Biden quite well, and he has been a friend of, our, of my country all these years. He's know the, he knows the region extremely well. On the other hand, I have to say the Trump administrator has served us well. And Mike Pompeo has also been a friend. And, also, and Mike Pompeo has also been here when we needed him, ready to answer, ready to try to provide solutions. So the question is, and I will go back to what David said, and I couldn't agree with that more, is that the new American administration and also Congress and the House of Representatives have to understand what is becoming apparent, that Turkey of today is not Turkey of the 60s or of the 70s, the ally we could rely on. Unfortunately, I'm not happy at all. I don't want my country to become a border state. But yet again, unfortunately, it seems that Turkey is drifting away from the Western alliance. We should make any effort within our values and without sacrificing the interest of our existing allies to keep Turkey with us. But we have to understand that this is a different reality from the past, that this Turkey is not the Turkey we used to know and we aspire to have as neighbor and ally. So much. I'd like to formulate my my notorious uh, takeaways, and I just got three points. But first of all, this is not just about energy resources or um, about uh, uh, maritime territory. This is about values. This is about the international rule of law. And so the European Union needs to be much more decisive than it has been in the past couple of weeks and months. Um, a second point. Uh, there probably is a window of opportunity for dialogue, for exploration, uh, but at the same time, the European Union should be actually much, much clearer in threatening sanctions if uh, escalation starts again from the Turkish side uh, in the Greek case. And anyway, there should be uh, a clear principled response to what Turkey is doing in violating the territorial integrity of Cyprus. But at the same time, don't give up on Turkey in the long run, even if they have uh, uh, certainly changed their course uh, for the worse in the last 15 years. Uh, it, you know, we still want in the long run Turkey as an ally and as part of the uh, a group of democracies in the world. And the third point refers to leadership in the European Union itself, better decision making, you know, with or without qualified majority voting, but better leadership. Uh, and, and that in this case, in the case of this crisis, that demand goes rightfully, um, first of all, to Germany, which holds the council presidency at the moment, and which should act with more decisiveness and more a more principled approach. And of course, so the allies of Germany uh, should probably make their voices heard in Berlin uh, in, in, in a more in a more in a louder way. And uh, uh, and I think uh, that might in the long run actually improve things, but it won't happen very fast. So, gentlemen, thank you so much, David Harris, Nikos Dendias, and um, thanks also to the to the uh, uh, Karamanlis Institute for co-hosting uh, this conversation on one of the big, big topical issues of the day. Stay tuned, stay safe uh, with the Martin Center and the Karamanlis Institute, and hope to see you again in person very, very soon. Thank you very much.